Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Our guest today is very active, playing four softball games each week, eating healthy, drinking plenty of water. She can't possibly have heart disease, or can she? Up next on Another View on Health, we'll talk about the silent killer that is the number one cause of death of women and disproportionately affects African-American women. We'll learn the warning signs and focus on lifestyle changes you can make right now to keep your heart healthy. Co-host and cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby will share the latest on research and treatment of heart disease. Loving your heart. It's another view on health and it's coming right up. So stay tuned. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. want to say a very special hello to our director of production, Jeff Fine, and his family. They've stopped in to say hello and to check us out here at Another View. So, hi, Fine family. How are you? <laughs> it's really good to have you guys with us. And I also want to say a very special thank you to all of what you who joined us this week at the Fort Monroe Theater for our Race Let's Talk About It town hall. We had a wonderful frank and candid discussion about the talk, the conversation African-American and Latino families have with their children about interacting with police. We had law enforcement representation from all seven cities of Hampton Roads, and they answered questions with honesty and integrity. And we were especially honored to have Dwayne Bryant, author of The Stop, Improving Police and Community Relations, join us at the town hall. Now, he um, was our guest on Another View last Friday, and he heard about the town hall and flew in from Chicago to join us. So thank you, Hampton Roads, for caring and engaging in these critical conversations designed to help all of us understand and know each other better. So today we're going to talk about what is probably the most important organ in our body, our heart. Unfortunately, lifestyle choices impact the health of our heart, and sometimes it just runs in the family. Here to help us understand why heart health is so critical is Ellen Jones, who is living with heart disease. Hi, Ellen. Hi. How are you? I'm blessed. How about you? Good. I'm doing fine. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. And my co-host for another View on Health, cardiologist, Dr. Keith Newby. Hey, Keith. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. a show that's like right up your alley. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm loving life on this one. I, 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 I feel in my comfort zone. Absolutely. You're in your comfort zone this time. So, Ellen, let's start with you. Tell us tell us your story. You have heart disease. Um, what were you doing first, and how did you find out? Well, uh, I went to the doctors to find out why I wasn't losing weight and thought maybe it might have been a thyroid problem. Uh, I've always exercised uh, six days a week, lift weights. Uh, I have three sons. Um, We were all in the military, myself, my husband, and all of our kids. So we lived a pretty healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. After going to the doctor and they ran some tests and they said, well, you don't have thyroid problems, but you are diabetic and Uh, we see some cardiomyopathy issues going on. So that was around 2009 to about 2014. And I guess my, the cardiomyopathy was at like 45%. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I started uh, going to see Dr. Newby. I was referred to him by my sister, which was an excellent choice. (laughs) Thank you. you. (laughs) (laughs) And then uh, September, 2014, um, it went down to like 40% injection fraction, but I was only having to see Dr. Newby once a year. And then around September 2015, that was coming once a year, it dropped down again to about 35%. So Keith, what is she, this number she's talking about that keeps dropping? What does that mean? Well, the ejection fraction is just a, uh, it's a fraction of the heart squeeze, meaning when you look at when the heart squeezes and relaxes, the difference between the two it, you know, and that's really about the chamber size. So the chamber size is say X, and you look mm-hmm. at when it squeezes, it goes down to Y. You take the fraction of the two, and that's called the ejection fraction. So it's a kind of a function of how well the heart's actually doing. Uh, now, a normal ejection fraction would be deemed as fifty-five percent or greater by definition. Okay. okay. Uh, people become more at risk when their ejection fraction drops to less than 35. So there's a gray zone between 35 and 50, okay. essentially, where although it's reduced, there is no data that says that they are at any higher risk for sudden death or worsening situations or really anything. And I have, in fact, I mean, when I first uh, 
met Ms. Jones, she reminded me of another patient similar who had had ingestion fraction forty five percent. I've been taking care of for twenty years and mm-hmm. it's still it's forty five percent. It's never changed. She never has any symptoms or problems. So if you look at and it and there's really no even a recommendation to treat that with medications. I tend to just treat it anyway because you try to defray what she has developed, which is a worsening cardiomyopathy over time. But that is kind of, you don't always know who's going to do that and who's not. who's not. So, Ellen, when your numbers started continuing to go down, did you make any other changes? I mean, you said you were living a pretty healthy lifestyle at that <laughs> point, right? <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> um, well, uh, Dr. Newby put me on some more medications okay. and started taking that. Um, and, again, I was already exercising, so I kind of didn't understand what was going on. But it just really came to my attention uh, this October 2016 was when uh, I went in for my annual visit uh, with Dr. Newby, and it went down to 20%. Ah. And uh, at that time, um, I do remember playing some softball and running around the bases and just noticed that it took me a little longer to catch my breath. So I just kind of thought, well, maybe somehow I've gotten out of shape. <laughs> and I just ruled it as that, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And uh, after talking with Dr. Newby and, and seeing that it's gone down to 20%, then I developed pneumonia. And then that's mm-hmm. what thrusted me into where I am now. Um, we didn't understand what was going on, so... Um, I had one emergency room visit. I had four urgent care visits in Virginia and Tennessee and three PCP visits from November to December. And Mm -hmm. everybody was still looking at it being pneumonia. And it wasn't until um, I was able to get back in to see Dr. Newby and he kind of knew what to do and and, um, admitted me into the hospital and said that it's more of congestive heart failure than the pneumonia Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and started treating that more aggressively. So, so at this point, What's the next step for for Ellen? Well, essentially, this is really where we are. You know, heart failure, unfortunately, so you don't always know the cause and why things progress Mm -hmm. uh, the way they do. You know, she has a pretty strong family history of this type of thing. And uh, although you don't see, I mean, you don't see a lot of family history of cardiomyopathy that I've run into more coronary disease issues, and that's typically mm. going to be like a lifestyle okay, issue. Let's get a couple of um, of definitions. So what's the difference between the cardiomyopathy and the coronary disease? Okay. Well, let's, then what I'd like to try to do is give people analogies to, okay. to work on because it helps them kind of conceptualize this better. I, I like to use my house analogy for the heart. I think it get, gives people a different perspective. If you look at your heart like a house, you know, in your house you have your floors, your ceilings, you have your foundation, you have your your rooms, you have doors that go from room to room, you have uh, plumbing in your house, you have electrical circuits. So look at the heart as similar. The the heart itself, if you look at the heart itself like a house, um, you have rooms in your heart that are called chambers, and you have heart valves that serve like doors that open, open and close, and close. Okay. to allow you to go from one room to the next. You also have um, electrical circuits in your heart, and that is the functionality what makes the heart beat. So um, the electrical impulse travels cell to cell, almost like if I were to be dumb enough to put my finger in the electrical socket and touch you and you yes. touch her, we all, we're all kind of... We're kinda, all yeah. <laughs> So each muscle cell acts similarly, so when the impulse um, reacts, it touches each muscle cell that kind of transverses that, and that's what makes the heart squeeze. And then you have your plumbing, which is like uh, the coronary arteries. Mm-hmm. So when you look at the functionality of um, or the heart in, for heart disease, you can separate out into these different areas. You know, is there a problem with the structure, which is like a cardiomyopathy? You know, is there a problem with the plumbing? That would be like coronary artery disease, which would lead to heart attack. So you turn on a faucet, you expect the water to come out, but if that pipe to that faucet is blocked, or if it's similarly semi-blocked, then of course you turn that water on, it's going to just drip out or not come out at all. Mm-hmm. So that's what coronary artery disease represents. So what she has is a problem with the foundation. You know, there's okay. there's a structural problem with her house, so to speak, that is creating the problems that she's having. So if you look at it like this, though, you can think about it in this terms, too. 
is every part can function independently but needs the other in order, in order to, to complete bring the, the whole, yeah, the whole, whole thing together. together. So you can have coronary disease and a cardiomyopathy. You can have coronary disease and no cardiomyopathy. You can have an electrical problem and a cardiomyopathy or neither. So, But everything needs the other because if you have no electricity in your house, your water can turn on, but you won't have hot water. Right. So everything is necessary you know, to help the, the whole but it can function somewhat independently. Mm -hmm. So what she has is more of a, because we've looked at her arteries, arteries are fine, so it's more uh, just a straight cardiomyopathy problem, but is of unclear cause. Now what we have seen is, um, even though we're assuming that the pneumonia was a heart failure, I really do think she probably had a pneumonia that started it, because you can't, mm -hmm. unless you just totally miss the boat on an x-ray, you know, uh, pneumonia indicates a consolidation of infectious material in the lung tissue. So that's a pretty characteristic look. So when you now what could have happened is that the pneumonia and the infection can impact the heart. So you can see sometimes where I see transient decreases in heart function. When I say transient, mean that sometimes it will bounce back. Uh, you know, but you have to get the person there. So you have to kind of correct the the underlying problem. When she came in. You know, she was having a lot of cough. Her her symptoms, and, and I don't fault any other physicians because her her really, her symptoms were really atypical, meaning you know she didn't have all the symptoms that would go along with a pure heart failure issue. The reason that I was able to pick it up, number one, because what I do for a living, but but more importantly, they had been treating her for weeks and she and wasn't, getting she wasn't getting so better. So to me, when you that's when we have to start thinking this thing through. When you have a situation where the standard treatments don't work, that means one of two things. Either the treatment's not working, meaning you don't have them on the right stuff, or that means what you're treating, that's not what, the, not problem what the problem is. is yeah. So I said, well, okay, let's look at this differently. We do know she has a cardiomyopathy. We do know she has some shortness of breath. She is having this cough. Let's not make an assumption this is still just poorly treated pneumonia. I really felt that stage is time for us to go down a different path, which is what we did. So are you looking at surgery, um, Ellen, or are you looking at more medicine, or she's, what are you looking at She's trying to duck and dodge right <laughs> She's ducking and dodging, huh? She's ducking and dodging. <laughs> we're, um, we're looking into it. <laughs> See, well, let me just go on a little further. This okay. is the issue. Um, with If you have... The cardiomyopathy, the, the problem with cardiomyopathies is you can have electrical disarray because the heart muscle is dilated. So the electrical circuits can sometimes get disjointed. As a reflection of that, that can lead to heart rhythm disturbances, which can lead to sudden death. And that's where the issue is. When your ejection fraction drops less than 35%, your relative risk for developing sudden death and other complications of heart failure start to rise. So the lower the number, the higher, higher the, the risk. risk. Okay. So you know, in order to defray that risk, that's when things like um, uh, defibrillators come into play. Now, take it a step further, there are additional treatments that can be done uh, for heart failure, and we do actively do that in this area, especially at the heart hospital. We get into things called left ventricular assist devices, which are like pumps that are implanted that mm. actually almost take the place, it almost like alleviates the pressure off the heart, and it actually pumps the blood around for you. And then there's, of course, cardiac transplant. The problem, though, with cardiac transplant is availability of hearts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're just not, you know, people are just not dying, you know, around. I hate to say it like that, but that's really what it takes. It's not like you can give a kidney, like you give right. a kidney or something. you can't give a part of can't your heart. It, yeah, you can't give that up. You need your whole heart. Yeah, so, yeah. so really what it boils down to, we've gone more to the left ventricular assist devices in people who have worsening heart failure to the point where we can't treat them medically. So when you have to implant a, a device, mm -hmm. either defibrillator or whatever mm -hmm. other type, is it a one-time implant or do you, does it wear out? Yeah, the defibrillators will, the batteries, because they're battery-operated devices. So the, the standard life of a defibrillator, but when I, of course, I'm a little older, so when I first started, <laughs> I mean, they were planted in the belly because they were like these big honker devices that would fit in. And the, actually, the cardiac surgeons used to put them in with our help as cardiologists. And that's when I was at Duke. Uh, but then at that time, around that time frame, we started, they, they started getting, because the technology got better, so they started okay. getting smaller. Mm -hmm. So we were able to put them in almost like pacemakers, but they were still kind of large devices at that time. But they're done under radiology guidance. Uh, we just act, we make a little nick up in the left shoulder area, and we typically will create a pocket in the skin, and I put in defibrillators myself. And we access the vein um, 
through with a small needle using radiology guidance. We flow the wire into the heart, which actually communicates from the heart to the device. So we take the device, attach it to the end of the wire, put it in this little pocket we create, and sew it up. So they're put in just like pacemakers now. So there's not it's not major surgery. The oh. pump is major surgery, but the defibrillator. The reason why we use those is because heart rhythm disturbances can lead to sudden death despite the functionality of the heart, meaning you can have somebody who feels great. Of course, she started ducking and dodging because she started feeling a lot better. So, And, and that's the danger of making people feel better because then all of a sudden they feel like they don't need certain things anymore. And I'm, I'm saying that loosely because I had to ride on her quite a bit. But Sounds uh, like you still having conversation, Alan. Is yeah, that right? Still yeah, because yeah, she was about ready to say, oh, I'm feeling great now. I don't need anything anymore. And, See and you I, next year. Yeah, so, so he was like, peace out. So, but, uh, but, but the bottom line is the relative risk of still developing sudden death is real. And the thing is, there's no predictability when that could occur you can walk around feeling fine when you hear about like somebody sitting watching tv TV and all of a sudden sudden it's die you know that's coming from this type of thing back to the hereditary piece for Uh a minute because you're you're, you have other people ella in your family who have heart disease is that right yes i do uh my mom is diagnosed with it uh first my mom and then my brother who's younger than me and then my sister that's younger than me. Mm-hmm. So they kind of been dealing with it for a while. Um, but mine, I felt like mine just came out of nowhere, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it has to be hereditary mm-hmm. because I try to take the necessary steps to be healthy. Um, I can't figure out any other reason why um, our audio engineer, Victor Bowen said that his mother um, warns him all the time because there's heart disease on both sides mm-hmm. of his family. So can you speak a little bit about about well, the hereditary aspect? Well, or? well I, I tell you what I'm finding more of. Um, what defines, you know, I, I, there's still to me a lot of question about cardiomyopathy family history because I don't see that as much. You know, I don't see that in families as much as I do coronary disease. Mm-hmm. Now, there is, I think, there's two parts to coronary disease. One is genetic predisposition, but typically that's when you're seeing people who are very young, like less than 55, having major, you know, coronary events. Once you're over 55, to be honest with you, I mean, anybody is apt to have a problem. Um, okay. you know, so what, but what defines what I have seen is one is genetics, but two is lifestyle. And unfortunately, so lifestyles do transmit family, you know, generation to generation. When you see, like, I always kind of always laugh when somebody's like really overweight and they say it's in my genes. I'm like, no, it ain't in your <laughs> genes. You just choose to live a certain way. And, I mean, we've all been victim of, yeah, of you know, weight issues because of how America, how we are in this country. Everything is about food. Mm-hmm. Everywhere you go, everything you do is all mm-hmm. about food and it's typically the wrong types of food. So we, that's why you see this trend to obesity, to diabetes, to hypertension is not so much because of our genetic predisposition. Uh, there is some truth to that, but I think it's more just the lifestyle, and that's what comes out of our lifestyle, our habits, you know, how we eat, how we, you know, lack of exercise. I mean, to be honest with you, she's one of the few people I have that actually eats it well and exercises. Yeah, exercise and exercise. Well. Mm-hmm. I mean, the majority of people I see, like I have like 25-year-olds, you put them on a treadmill and they are two minutes, they're about to black out. And wow. I'm looking at them like, and they're saying, oh, you're about to kill me on this thing. And I'm like, you're only 25. <laughs> I mean, but that is the trend of what we see. Mm-hmm. There's just a lack of, of activity. Everybody's, you know, because we're in the technology age. And, then, and they're sitting and, and yeah. using the technology exactly. as opposed to being it, out exactly. and being active. So 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. What questions do you have about your heart health? Are you making lifestyle changes so that you can keep your heart healthy? 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So why are black women at such a risk, Dr. Newby, for heart disease? Well, I think it still goes back to the, unfortunately, so it still goes back to the lifestyle thing. I mean, when you look at pound for pound, um, you know, weight classes, chronic illnesses in the African-American population are going to be higher than they are in non-white, pop, I mean, non, non-African-American populations. Mm-hmm. You'll see um, the, the hypertension history is up. And hypertension can lead to 
heart failure and cardiomyopathies and coronary disease and diabetes. And is that because the heart has to work so much harder? Yeah, yeah because, because okay. if, you look, if you look at, think about it like this, the, you got this tube that is the aorta. Heart's got to push blood through this tube. The tube's going to have a certain amount of inherent pressure in it. So the heart says, okay, I got to push X amount to get it through there. The higher the pressure, the harder the heart has to work to push it through there. That's why sometimes you hear the term enlarged hearts. So a lot of times that comes from uh, thickening of the heart, from the heart pushing for so hard for so long. The unfortunate reality with hypertension diabetes, as I mentioned uh, before, is their chronic illnesses that are characteristically asymptomatic. So it's hard to convince people, and I understand. You know, when you're feeling fine, you, you're you know just you're, you're out doing your thing, you're enjoying life, you're able to do anything and everything you want to do. It's hard to convince somebody that they're not well mm -hmm. i mean because they feel fine so it's hard to convince them okay you need to take this medicine every day you need to do this you need to make these changes I'm like saying why am i got to do why do i have to do that i almost wish that you could make people not feel well if they don't take if the medicine because take... <laughs> <laughs> i mean even though that sounds kind of bad but it really isn't because of you know because think about it, if you have an infection you will not hesitate to take that antibody. That's very true. But say they told you to take it for seven days. You feel fine by day four. Are you going to continue with the day seven? I bet you won't. Well, no, I do. Yeah, but, but you, but some people don't, people don't. But a lot of people the majority, don't. The majority very, of people don't. True. They will stop taking it. Alan, let me ask you a question. So knowing that you're living with this, I mean, what goes through your mind? Because I've always wondered in, in terms of a mental um Per, the mental perspective of knowing you have a chronic chronic disease, um, but you don't quite know what's going to happen and when. I mean, do you let it overpower your life or do you just go on? Well, I don't. My, my faith is in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So uh, anything and everything that I go through, I'm always giving it to the Lord and trusting him. Uh, I'm still trying to kind of get out of the denial phase. Like, do I really, really have this? And that's the conversation that I have with Dr. Newby. I just want to make sure. Yeah, on a regular basis. Yeah, the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just make sure that, you know, this is accurate. This is the best choice of, uh, of treatment that we need. And now feeling the way that I felt, which was really, really bad. I know that something was really wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, again, um, I just trust in the Lord, and I just believe that whatever time it's time for me to go, it's time for me to go. I don't care what gets done. So have you changed? So you haven't changed anything in terms of, like, the exercise oh. or I, other than being tired now, I know, because of the illness, but but in terms of the way you eat, the way you exercise, the amount of time? And that I, kind of I, the change, I haven't gotten back into exercising yet because okay. I just really started feeling good, like, last week. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and um, <laughs> but the changes. Another change that I've made was the sodium, and I, my my husband and I, we cook, and we don't cook with sodium. We, you know, that was a, a taboo. We used the garlic. We used different herbs. We 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 used all these things, but then not realizing that, uh, that sodium is in other stuff, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And I call myself. Well, we can have a can of soup. That's healthy. And not realizing it was so much sodium. How much sodium is actually so, in. So that's a major change that we've had to make to kind of look at something. Okay. And and have you thought about other foods and, and so forth? Because sodium, is that's a hard one. Yeah. Because you don't realize just how much salt is in, in things. And right. we don't. And just like last night, I brought some I bought some uh, cod, some cod fish frozen. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was packed. It had 560 milligrams of sodium just in the fish. It wasn't fried or anything. It was just it was just frozen cod fish. But because they pack packed it, it, so that was supposed to be a healthy meal. Well, now she unfortunately can't do this. But um, one of the things I was gonna laugh with you about later, you know, you know, I always get on my diet kick it once a year, and I'll sit there and drop a whole bunch of weight, and I gain it back, and I lose it again. What I tell you, one thing I'm doing now different that I didn't do. Now she can't do this, but I can. Mm -hmm. Is uh, I started doing this water thing. Now I, you know, my wife jokes with me about this because she knew I hate water, and and it's not that I I shouldn't say hate. Hate's a strong word. I I, I dislike water, <laughs> but. What I found, and I just started this about a week and a half ago, I drink a gallon of water a day. I make myself do it. And That's I'm going to tell you, my one thing, does that too. you know, that has changed me in terms of, like, eating habits because I don't get hungry sure. hardly anymore. And I want to go throw out to people, if you're trying to diet, and, and, and everybody tried to tell me this for a long time, but I fought water <laughs> tooth and nail. But 
if you drink it, you just make it cold. You know, just, I mean, for me, but I've been doing that every day. Now, I live in the bathroom, I feel like, but <laughs> I have, found, I, when I eat anything now, I can't eat as much. I mean, I really, I get full quick, mm-hmm. but I don't feel bad. I mean, you know, I feel better having done that. Now, don't tell my wife I said that because she's going <laughs> to. She's gonna ride me like She's a fine stallion, you. but exactly. uh, you know, but that does make a big difference. Now, seeing the water, they can't. Am I not supposed to drink no, no, more? Not no. like that. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Anyway, uh, we're talking about that later. Go ahead, exactly. do your thing. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the latest in research, prevention, and treatment of heart disease with Ellen Jones, who is living with heart disease and co-host of Another View on Health, cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby. Let's talk to Toby in Chesapeake. Hi, Toby. You're on the air. Uh, yes, hi. Thanks hi. so much for taking my call. Uh-huh. Um, I tuned in a little bit later in the show, so I'm not sure if you all had already talked about this, but um, it was just something that came to my mind, so I wanted to call um, just to share. Um, as, as far as um, being mobile, you know, being active, mm-hmm. I make an attempt, and that's why I said I'm going to go ahead and call because I did this literally five minutes ago. I drove over here to meet someone for lunch, but I said, let me park a little bit further away from the building intentionally so that I can, <laughs> you know, so that I can walk. Um, and I just want to share that, you know, there are really very small things that we can, you know, do to try to make, um, you know, habits. Um, just so that we're getting some kind of activity. You know, my, my lifestyle at work, um, I try to move around as much as possible, but like many, I have a sedentary, um, uh, you know, work Position. space where I'm mm-hmm. kind of sitting down <laughs> for most of the day. And so little things like this, when I come out and I park in a parking lot, I don't go looking for the spaces closest to the building. I look for the one that's a little further back. Mm-hmm. Just to make mm-hmm. sure that I can, you know, stretch my legs some. Toby, have you tried um, the uh, stand-up desk uh, in you know, your, at I your office? Been, I've been looking at those, and I love the idea of it. Um, it's <laughs> something that I do want to explore because I think it's really neat. Yeah, um, and I will tell you, too, as far as, like, the time at work, you know, I do. I try to stand up. I'll, like, lean on the back, um, hold the back of my chair and just kind of stretch. Sometimes, mm-hmm. even when I'm sitting down, I'm like rotating my ankles around just to kind of try to keep some circulation going. Um, but, you know, just trying to do little things during okay. the day that will, um, you know, prevent me from just not moving at all. Okay. Um, and one other thing I just want to share real quickly, because as I was on hold, I heard the conversation switch a little bit to diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I heard what Dr. Newby was saying about the water, and I can sure appreciate that. I'm trying to drink more water, too. <laughs> Tough, isn't um, it? <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, I actually carry a very specific um, container with me. I believe it's 17 ounces. So I tell myself, we'll have two of those before 12 noon. Try to fill it up again and have at least two more before you leave for the day. You know, I try to just play a little mind games with myself <laughs> like that. Um, but the one thing I want to say about diet, I have heard about this. I haven't started doing it myself yet, but I'm thinking about giving it a try. And that is to, like, at least two days out of the week to do kind of a mini fast um, in terms of, like, just having uh, raw foods or, you know, fruits and vegetables for two days out of the week. I like to just go ahead and cut back on the bread, cut back, don't have the butter on the roll. You know, like two days out of the week to just really eat more, um, you know, foods from the earth, you know, natural or, or raw foods. And I thought that was a kind of a neat concept. Um, and it's just a way, you know, to eat a little bit lighter a couple of days a week. Um, but making sure that you're still getting your, you know, the nutrition that you need. So okay. just want to kind of put that out there for the listeners. Like that. I haven't tried that one yet, but I was thinking about it. All right, Toby, so let's see thing- what Dr. Newby has to say about the, about your ideas. Thanks so much and enjoy your lunch. We appreciate you. Go ahead, yeah. Keith. Well, well, yeah, I think she's, uh, I, I, you know, some some individuals, include myself, like I had to build up to that gallon of water. It was tough. <laughs> but, you know, I think like anything else, sometimes you have to, kind of gradually get into things because some people just function better you know mm-hmm. doing certain things than others the uh you know I, what has been my experience though is if you're trying to maintain you know you're just trying to maintain then i think her concept is definitely uh, probably workable 
it's a, all about the balance and what you're doing on those other days. You know, so you do the two right. days that you're doing, you know, the fruit good, and vegetables, yeah, right. but, but you can't you have cake and ice cream yeah, for all exactly. the, the other and seven then, days. And then, yeah. the, then the type of fruits you're eating, because, you know, if you look, think about, you know, certain fruits and people tend to like sweeter things. So they're going to eat typically the higher calorie fruits, mangoes, bananas, uh, grapes, Mm-hmm. raisins i mean that stuff's like high in sugar i mean that's like the highest sugar fruits there is it, now it, is there a difference between a natural sugar and and that kind of sugar well in terms of, it, of your health well yes i mean it's always going to be healthy for you to do that versus, versus. some something that's manufactured mm-hmm. but the the weight's going to still be you know it's going to still come on you just as readily with some of those higher fruit you know higher uh, calorie fruits where they, where they have characteristically talked about doing more of the berries, you know, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, uh, some cantaloupe, honeydew, melon, some things that are typically lower in sugar because that will allow you to still be able to do some of that, but you won't have the extra calorie intake with it. It's just that balancing act, and people don't really really know how to do that. How does, um, because, you know, they, we often talk about obesity yeah. and that being a major part of, of heart problems. And I read this study, now, you can tell me if this is correct, Dr. Newby. It says that if an obese black woman has any two of the following, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low good cholesterol, mm-hmm. impaired glucose metabolism, or large waste, that there's a 117% increased chance of heart attack or stroke, mm-hmm. but the same is not true of white women. Is there something in our genes that make that different, well, or are we just heavier? Well, you know, I, it, it, it depends on that study how they look i mean did they look at like all white women or just women with the same body makeup same body makeup well you know that's that's how i had to see that study to to understand that a little bit better because i'm not sure i'm convinced that the gen see because another it sounds issue, like genetics well more. the other issue becomes is like when you talk about they have high blood pressure or diabetes mm-hmm. Were they controlled high blood pressure and diabetic situations or not? Because that's the, those are the factors to me I would have to have heard to really know if they could compare that, make an accurate comparison. What I have found is, unfortunately, so our folks are not as compliant, you know, not as diligent with things in general, you know. So you'll find that because them, I, that, that's my biggest fight that I have in the office is folks just not, just not taking not, the medicine. Yeah, and they just tell you straight up, I'm not taking it. I mean, why not? I mean, and and they really, I just don't like taking medicine. I said, but based on what? And they can't ever answer that question. Mm -hmm. They'll just say, well, and and, and I got folks that have a, like a, a boat full of vitamins and stuff. And and I'm like, you know how much all that stuff you just got cost? I mean, it's a whole lot more than that medicine I gave you. (laughs) But they, and it was all side effects. Like, but you know, the thing is, you're taking unregulated stuff. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. you won't read about side effects on a lot of that stuff you're taking because they don't have to publish it. I said, you don't really know. That's not natural. That's a pill somebody made. That you're not eating some tree bark or something. And when you talk, because you you've mentioned this before Mm -hmm. on the show, but when you talk about the side effects of a drug, Mm -hmm. I mean, you take into consideration, I assume. the side effects yeah. that could help it yeah. could impact that particular individual like yeah. Ellen when whatever you prescribe oh, for her. But you know, when you listen to those commercials and you hear, <laughs> I know. you know, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's going to be everything except the apocalypse <laughs> I know, that's going to yeah. happen to you. How do we balance that so yeah. that, so that, so that people don't come yeah, to you and I say, know. doc, I'm not going to do that because yeah. look at all these side effects. I know. That, that's, I, I wish they wouldn't do that. The The problem is, if what we see is docs. We ha- we get this physician death reference. It's a big book that has really every drug listed. It lists um, you know the, the the details of the medication, but also talks about side effects. And when it talks about side effects, like which, what I really wish pharmacists didn't do. And I don't know why they do this, but in those printouts they give you, they just yeah. list everything up there. Exactly. See, what we see when we look at the books is it lists like okay, like they test a thousand people, and they'll say okay. 30% had these, 20% had these, 10 percent had these. And when you get to less than 1%, it's like 8 million the majority things. It's a majority that, that of the side effects. A majority oh, of it. But when they give you those sheets, they list everything. And so right. you don't so really we don't know have any what perspective. to. Yeah, you really don't. So that's where we have to come into play. And I usually tell people, okay, I'm going to put you on this. 
you know, and this is what you can expect. This is what I've seen characteristically with this medicine. And I and I will admit, I got some folks that I, I could give them a placebo and they're going to have a side effect from it. I mean, I, I, I sure as I know my name, I got a couple in my mind right now. I even hate to even say I need to put you on this because I'm like, I know I'm going to get a call in two days about eight million things wrong with them behind this drug. And some people, they are sensitive. I, I mean, I, I say it partly jokingly, partly serious. There are certain medications you do have to be mindful of that they do have a bunch of side effects, potential. But I tell people all the time, just because they're listed doesn't mean you're going to experience them. Yeah. I've had to weigh it out. I have to weigh out a, a pro and con, risk, benefit. You know, in the end, my job is to keep you alive. You know, with the good Lord's help, that's my job, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. I need some help, though. Because <laughs> you know, if mean, you don't yeah, take it. If you don't take it and you're not you telling do. me, you know, if, you do, if you're not going to take it from day one, then just let me know. I mean, I don't want to sit there and thinking I'm doing all this stuff and you come back feeling the same way you did before and I found out you, ain't, you never took it. Uh, you know, that's not helping you, nor is it helping me help you. Mm -hmm. So I tell people all the time, just, you know, just be up front. Ask honest questions. My job is to answer those questions honestly, try to give you a perspective but just most of us as docs, we're not trying to kill anybody with this stuff. We're trying to help you, and we and and but there's going to be some give and take. You know, you have to, and yeah. I and again, that's why I try to have a relationship with the patients. Not just it's not dictatorship. It's me telling you what I think you need to hear, pros and cons, risks and benefits, and say this is what I would do under that circumstance. Under same, same circumstance. Linda joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Linda. You're on the air. Hi. How you doing? All righty. Um, I actually wanted to chime in on the water thing that actually came up after I called. Yeah, um, I started some with that. <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome. Uh, I carry around a, uh, it's a thermal one liter bottle of water with me all the time. My dad used to call it my sock. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the thing is, by having it be a one-liter bottle of water, I finish it. Okay, that's one. I usually go through about two liters before noon. Okay. And about another two liters after. And uh, I'm a hiker. My dogs love the fact that I've started working out again because that means they get to go walk in the woods. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll, two other things I'd like to bring up because I'm currently trying to lose a small person and, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got to stay it the way that it is. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Go ahead. Um, over the course of the last five years, I've had to have multiple surgeries on one leg. Okay. And at pushing 60, it's. And you, when you're used to being very active, it's real easy for those pounds to creep up on you. Mm -hmm. And it's real hard to lose them. And it's really, really hard to get back into shape when you're that age. A whole okay. lot easier when you're 25. <laughs> what question do you have for Dr. Newby? Well, the thing is, my husband is about the same, same age I am. He has a family history on both sides of his family of heart disease. His mother had arrhythmia. Uh, his, his father had his first heart attack before 40. He had a quadruple bypass at 50. And his grandfather died of a massive, both grandfathers died of massive heart attacks. And his younger brother had his first heart attack at 45. I try real hard to get him to eat right. But he's one of those tall, skinny dudes that can eat what, thinks he can eat whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. And my son's the same way. Help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Linda, let's get some ideas from Dr. Newby. Well, well, Thanks so much for your call. Well, well, I, I, I tell you, you, you are probably about one of about eight Kazian people with a similar, <laughs> similar problem is how to deal with family members who seem like they just don't listen and don't care to listen i think like anything else ignorance is bliss you know um just avo avoidance is bliss and a lot of times what's happening is 
they're aware of this, but they try their best to um, just act like it's not happening around them. They're well, okay. What may have happened to my brother may have happened to this person or that person, but it's not going to happen to me. And then they just put it out of their mind. The thing is you can't make anybody do anything. I, I, I'll tell you right now, you'll just drive yourself to drink trying to do that. It's just, it's not going to happen. What you can do and what I do with my patients, and a lot of times like I say, you know, not to, not to be religious on there, but I pray for them and I try to get them to see. And, and what I try to do with my men is I try to, to really make them feel bad about what they're doing. And, and when I say that, this is what I mean when I say that. I, I will ask them, and especially if their wives are with them or, or even if they're not, but I know they're married, I will ask the question to them. I said, you know, my remembrance is you know, I met your wife. And, you know, she seemed like a very nice young lady. And he'll say, yes, you know, she's good to me. And and I'll say, well, let me ask you this. When you married her, I said, you know, did you ask her to marry you? And, you know, a lot of times they'll say, yes, I did. I said, well, think about it. Look at it like this. You have taken on a responsibility once you've asked her to marry you. Do you have kids? He'll say, yes, okay. You have a responsibility once you've taken on children. Somebody has to care for this family. That is you. As a man of this household, your responsibility is to, I said not to get biblical on you, but your responsibility is to do for that family. Now, if you're not doing for you, that means there's a high likelihood they're going to lose you. Then what do they do? Mm -hmm. I said, when they, and I get some men that give me this response, oh, they'll be all right. I said, that's selfish though. I said, because you're only thinking about you. Mm -hmm. I said, you have to think about them. How do you know they're going to be okay? How do you know this? I said, are you saying that you hit the lotto and they got you got twenty million dollars in the in the bank and they feel that your your utility to them is solely financial? I said, your place in this home is more than just financial. I said, so you have a moral obligation to be there for this family, to be doing everything you can do to help them. So I, I tend to, because I can read them the riot act about the medical problem all day long. They'll just keep going into denial. But when you put it in perspective of day-to-day day day to day life. Day-to-day yeah. day life, I said, and I'm trying to get them to see it from a different angle. And that, that plays a big factor. That's the, the what I'm going to do to her to well, get her to do. Well, I was just getting ready to say He already that. gave me that speech last uh, week. Yeah. <laughs> So, See, you already got this piece. Yeah, yeah. But, Ellen, how about your family? I mean, what, what type of support have you gotten, and, and has there been pushback? Because, you know, I mean, you're not eating salt. You have to change the way you eat. You know, I mean, you know how family can be sometimes. How, how does that work for you? I'm so blessed and so thankful that I have a supportive family. And while I was in the hospital, I, uh, my, my son and daughter-in-law came from Florida, and she started fixing some meals for me and just gave me, you know, the healthier, healthier, version <laughs> like missing everything but the, and and my husband is a great cook and so he's looking at his health as well you know okay. whatever is going on with me he's making sure that it doesn't happen with him and so he's gone on board with monitoring and we're taking and looking at cans and looking at whatever it is that we're look, looking at the bags and mm -hmm. seeing you know what sodium what carbs what fat trying to drink more water <laughs> yeah, let me let me let me let me make a comment about her water issue just okay. so and i want the audience to, to hear this as well we got just, about five minutes yeah, left too. this is the issue oh. with water they look at and again, another analogy. Look at, um, I'm going to use another one. Look at the heart like a sink. You have okay. a sink, you have your faucet, you have your drain. So look at the drains like your kidneys and the faucets like the veins bringing blood back to the heart and the sinks like your heart. So if I cut on the faucet and say I put just enough water that comes out of the faucet, goes down the drain. Look at that as a normal heart situation. Okay. So now suppose I cut on that water faster and I've cut it off faster to the point where it's not getting all out the drain. What's going to happen? The sink's going to start to fill. Right? Mm -hmm. When that sink overflows, that is like what happens in heart failure. So what you have to do in that situation is slow down the faucet or you have to open up the drain more. So what your situation would be like is, is that when you're drinking more water, that's like turning that faucet faster. And you're more apt to start filling up that sink because the kidneys can only work but so fast. And then think wow. of it, and your heart is like the pump that has to get the blood to the kidneys. So if you have a, a pump that's not effectively getting all that fluid to the kidneys to make that urine, what's going to happen? It's going to start building up because the heart can only take but so much when it's weak. Mm -hmm. So that's when the issue comes about is watching. And I, I'm not saying 
don't drink any water at all, but you just have to be careful how much. So in other words, she should not be doing the gallon of no, water a day. No, no, that's like why, that's why I made that caveat okay. when we first started okay. talking. What I always tell people is a liter and a half max a day okay. of fluids should be what you're doing. Give us, we've we got less than five minutes um, in the show, symptoms. Okay. Just tell us if what should we watch out for three minutes actually. The main, main so, thing is some symptoms. Main thing is uh, shortness of breath and fatigue, and that's what I'm finding now. I don't want to have everybody going to panic mode because those are very non-specific <laughs> yeah. symptoms. But you want to look at if you're having chest discomfort. You know, most people with heart disease, with coronary disease, will describe subternal tightness or squeezing sensation that may radiate, may not. Mm-hmm. What I find mostly is people have shortness of breath when they walk. They will get sometimes they get short of breath when they lay down and they wake up in the middle of the night acutely short of breath. Now, there could be other things doing that as well, but that may be a sign of heart problems. So, shortness of breath, shortness of breath laying down, swelling in the legs, some in certain okay. situations. And uh, the bigger one I've found is just exhaustion. You know, they, they just, I mean, they just feel just I, kind of just I, used to, yeah, legs. I used to be able to walk this distance. Now I'm like, man, I just try to walk this distance. I just can't make it. So I want, but I want to caveat. It's not like one individual thing. Normally, it's a conglomerate of symptoms that you will feel. Mm-hmm. I just listed them out, but it's not going to be like just shortness of breath and nothing else. Typically, there's going to be something else with it. So I okay. want to make sure I warn people: don't just hear one thing and say, "I had that last week. I have heart failure." No, right. you 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 probably do not. But it's it's the whole conglomerate of symptoms. But what I would tell people is if you're questioning it, just go see your doc and get it clarified. That's the best way That's to go. That's the best way. And, Alan, what would you say from a woman's perspective? What do you want to tell women about their hearts and taking care of their hearts? Uh, if you know that you do have uh, heart issues in your family, definitely go get checked out. And I, since then, have been having a conversation with my sons to um, to, to start telling them to go get checked. Mm-hmm. Uh it's important to um, get the, the annual physicals once a year and, and just to eat right. Even if you are healthy or you feel that you're healthy, just to stay active, just to stay active, exercise, because you need it for mental health as well as for physical health, uh, just so that um, we can live longer in the land. And yeah, don't duck and dodge your doctor either. And, do, and don't, don't dodge your doctor, no. And, you know. but, but speaking of doctors and, and this last minute that we have here, if someone um, thinks that they might be having a heart problem, should they go straight to you, Mr. Specialist, or do they go to their uh, primary care first? Well, it, it kind of depends. I think you have to look at it because sometimes, unfortunately, so some primaries may not always recognize you know, some of those symptoms. Mm-hmm. What, I, what I tell people all the time is use your best judgment. You have to look at everything you're experiencing, you know, and then more importantly, look at your health in general. If you know you have high blood pressure, you know you're diabetic, you know you're a smoker and you don't do anything, you need to probably see somebody. <laughs> like me absolutely thank okay. you dr Not keith newbie problem. thank you ellen thank you. jones i appreciate thank it and we will be right back i'm with marcellus and you all are checking out another view don't go anywhere check us out And welcome back. What if you could look fashionable while carrying everything you needed and help the environment all in one fell swoop? Well, a young designer right here in Hampton Roads has created a product product that he says can do just that. You're about to meet Hamilton Perkins, whose earth bags are popular examples of how one man's trash is another man's treasure. So the idea in the beginning, Lisa, was to make a bag that I could be proud to carry. I was interested in making it out of something that was sustainable. But Hamilton Perkins couldn't find an example of what he was looking for in a department store or online. So he decided to design it himself. I ran a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. We had a $10,000 goal. We hit that in under a week, fortunately. And from there, we basically got things going. I won the Virginia Velocity Tour after that. Following that, I was elected to basically work with Bloomingdale's to do a trunk show in New York. What makes the Hamilton Perkins collection so unique is the materials that are used to create the bags. So each bag takes about 16 bottles out of the environment and we sourced the bottles from 
uh, the developing world, and we get the billboards from uh, mainly the United States right now. And it takes about one yard of recycled billboard vinyl out of a landfill. So each bag is different. Each bag is unique. The plastic bottles are basically what you see on the outside of the bag. The inside is made from recycled billboards, like a billboard you'd see uh, on the interstate, Times Square, downtown. We take that and before it goes into a landfill, you know, we cut the pattern, we cut it, and then we sew it into this bag. Perkins, who received his undergraduate degree from ODU and his MBA from the College of William and Mary, says the show at Bloomingdale's was definitely one of the highs of going into business for himself. It's over the holidays, the height of the holiday season, being able to introduce our product, which you know, really started from trash, you know, honestly, and that being able to connect with a prestigious clientele like Bloomingdale's was just uh, a dream come true. Hamilton's line of bags consists of two styles, a duffel bag with two handles and a backpack. But there are several variations, bringing the total line to 24. So the backpack is two bags in one. It's a duffel bag, and you can zip away the backpack straps. So it's easy to carry on a plane, fits under a seat on a plane. The earth bags are adorned in practical but fashionable colors to fit just about every taste, from natural to navy, cognac to Carolina blue, just to name a few. While most of Hamilton's customers shop his earth bags online, the Hampton Roads native has set up shop right here at home. I moved into the Old Dominion University Innovation Center, opening up a really small showroom there where customers can basically come and take a look at our bags, shop our bags, and that brings us up to the present moment. And now we're building out our website and getting all of our ducks in a row for 2017. Perkins also has a second location on Bush Street in Norfolk. His advice to any young entrepreneur eager to venture out into the business world is to find a product that solves a personal problem. You know, you can pretty much find something in your daily routine that's a pain point for you, and that's a good chance that it's a pain point for other people as well. So if you can come up with a practical solution to that, then you could have a, a business on your hands, and, and then beyond that, work hard and don't give up. He's quick to point out that there will be highs and lows, but sums up his six-month journey with his earth bag collection this way. I'm just excited for the opportunity to continue to work on something that I'm really passionate about. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. And you can check out the Hamilton Perkins collection by visiting hamiltonperkins.com. And it's wonderful. We'd like to profile young entrepreneurs here in the Hampton Roads area. So if you have some ideas, send them to us at contact at anotherviewradio.org. Thank you for joining us for Another View. If you'd like to hear the show again or share it with a friend, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org. We're on Facebook, so like us. And I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham. Lee. Next time on Another View, the role of social workers in our public schools, how their intervention could mean more success for our students. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Show producer Lisa Godley is off today, so a very, very special thank you to Danny Epperson. Hi, Danny, <laughs> for stepping in. We appreciate you. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer, and Jada Baden answered our phones. And before I leave you, I must take a moment to say a very, very special thank you to Tidewater Community College. Last night, I was honored as a Martin Luther King 2017 Martin Luther King Community Service uh, Award received from them, and that was a wonderful tribute. And so thank you to the TCC family, Dr. Colavani, and everyone who was involved. And thanks to those of you who came out to support me. Thanks so much. My name is Barbara Ham Lee. It's been my pleasure to serve as your host today on Another View. Thanks for listening and we'll see you soon.